actually doing yeah. a slide deck. No, I'm going to jump between individual pictures. I'm not going to okay, we're this recording now. Hi, Tom. Thanks for making time. Thank you, Daniel. Over to you. Right. Um, you want me to go, to go ahead? Okay, so yeah. I should introduce myself, obviously, to begin with. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah. Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, my name is Tom Goro, and um, I'm the president of the Global Coral Reef Alliance, and I'm also chief scientist of Blue Regeneration SL, among other things. I'm, um, I'm a scientist, I'm a biogeochemist, I mainly work on ecosystem restoration in the context of climate change. Uh, we're interested fundamentally in regenerating all the world's ecosystems in order to regenerate their ecosystem services, including the regulation of climate, temperature, atmospheric com um, composition, CO2 in the atmosphere in particular. And uh, as you know, uh, through the development of industrial technology in the last few hundred years, we've created a situation where we have destroyed half of the biosphere. Uh, there used to be twice as much biomass in the world, roughly, as there is now. And um, that's gone. And most of that carbon that was sitting there in forests and has disappeared has turned into CO2. The soil carbon that is underneath that, that's, that's probably something like five or 10 times more than what is in the biomass itself. It's a huge carbon store. And every place that we have transformed the land from forest into agriculture, into pasture or grazing, or into any kind of human development, towns, cities, et cetera, et cetera, um, we have lost at least half of the carbon that was in the soil. And that's much bigger than what was in the biomass. So in destabilizing the system, we've made the climate change situation worse. But at the same time, we've destroyed their capability of what only living organisms really do affect, which is to pull CO2 out of the atmosphere, store it in trees, and then down into the ground, which is really the long-term storage. So that's a fundamental ecosystem service. The biosphere regulates our climate. It regulates the availability of water. It regulates the amount of food we have. And so we've really crippled ourselves in destroying it. And part of our view is that by regenerating ecosystems, intelligently in a way to maximize biomass and maximize productivity and maximize biodiversity, we, we can reverse some of these uh, catastrophes that we have caused. And, and the critical thing is, from my point of view, is we have to stabilize CO2 at climate at safe levels because at the moment we are on a path of runaway global warming. This is something a lot of people don't understand. But the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change talks about the in increases of temperature or sea level in 5, 10, 15, 20 years, maybe 50 years or so, because the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change does not have a scientific mandate. It has a political mandate. Politicians want to know what might happen while they might be blamed or responsible or have to make decisions, but they don't want to know what's going to happen 100 years from now, 1,000 years from now, 10,000 years from now. Now, the fact is, is that, that the climate system has a built-in time lag of several thousand years. When we increase CO2 in the atmosphere now, the response of temperature is going to be thousands of years in the future. It's not immediate. And that is because the heat is being stored in the ocean. It takes 1,500 years for the ocean to turn over. The deep ocean is all at refrigerator temperature. Until that warms up, we won't feel the full effect of warming at the surface. Right now, that heat is disappearing into the deep sea. We're not feeling it. If that heat had been accumulating at the surface of the Earth, 93% of the heat is vanishing into the ocean. But if it had been sitting here at the surface, the planet would already be unlivable. That's something people don't understand. Now, the IPCC projections ignore more than 90% of the impacts that we know are going to happen. And that's based not on models, it's based on the real long-term climate change data for the Antarctic ice cores and deep sea cores and corals and all that sort of thing. We know how temperature, CO2, and, and uh, sea level have varied in the past. They're good data records. And when we use that to determine the sensitivity of global sea level and global temperature to CO2, we find that they are far more sensitive than the IPCC models imply. Was, and, and just to give an example, IPCC will tell us that for doubling of CO2, uh, no, actually for the present, you know, 
what people are talking about is, is increases of temperature of you know, one or two or three degrees Celsius and changes in sea level, well now people argue about that, but you know, tens of centimeters, maybe a meter or so, and they talk about that happening by the end of the century. My point is, is these are just the very beginnings of trends that are going to accelerate and continue going for thousands and thousands of years. And so IPCC only considers the very initial part. It doesn't consider where we're going. And the point is that we are already on a route to runaway climate change that will result in melting all the ice caps. Now, when we look at the actual long-term climate change data itself, the real numbers, what we find is that for 400 parts per million of CO2, which we passed already several years ago, we're now at 416, but for 400 parts per million, what the climate change data shows is that the steady state changes in global temperature would be about 17 degrees Celsius warmer than today, and the sea level would be about 23 meters higher than today. That's for 400 ppm. We're already well past that. And it's accelerating, and we're, we're really on a path now that will ultimately result in the melting of Greenland and Antarctica. And that's 70 meters of sea level change. That, that's where we're headed right now. We're on target to get that way. Now, that doesn't happen quickly because um, even Greenland is going to take three or four or 5,000 years to melt. It's melting at an incredible rate. But there's a lot of ice and it happens slowly. So that this impact won't be in our lifetime, but we have guaranteed it's going to happen to future generations. So it, what I'm trying to say is the situation is far more terrifying than the public understands or the politicians will admit or want to hear about, because in a sense, they only want to hear good news. So they basically cook the books to get the answer they want, which is not the answer that affects humanity or our planet. So my point is that, that to prevent that, inevitable catastrophe um, from a scientific point of view. Our only real solution is to reduce the amount of CO2 into the atmosphere. Now, mind you, there's a lot of proposals for expensive technological solutions. And uh, what we're proponents of is what we call geotherapy, which is basically the regeneration of the natural biological mechanisms that regulate our planet's climate and atmospheric composition. Uh, that, that's, uh, we call that geotherapy, which is basically treating the earth as a sick patient. The earth is running a fever, the temperature is out of control. What do you, what would you do as a doctor with your patient to stabilize the temperature and bring it down to a safe level? So that's what we call geotherapy is correcting the ills. Now that, that has two branches. One is biogeotherapy, which is use of natural ecosystems. The other is what we call geoengineering, which is physical fixes like spraying sulfuric acid into space and giving the earth an acid bath. Now, people are seriously proposing that. I mean, they're enormously putting mirrors out in space. They're, they're solutions that are enormously expensive, unproven, and likely have side effects that are worse than the problem they're trying to solve. So our focus is really on, on ecosystem regeneration on a global scale to try to solve the problem. Um, now, there are many aspects of that, and obviously we're here to talk about seagrasses and Posidonia mainly, but I just want to put this in the context of the larger global issues of humanity as a whole faces, and if we don't solve this problem, I mean, we're going to basically wipe out our species and many others. Uh, cockroaches will survive, bacteria will survive, although they'll have to evolve, but, but uh, the planet will not be that planet that the human humans have evolved and adapted to. It will not be one that we could, we could live in securely at all. I would love to have a, another conversation to talk about soil at some point, but as you said, like we're, we're focusing on, on um, marine regeneration. and, yes, and just right. Okay, so should I just continue? Um, yeah, yeah, wonderful. So, so essentially, what, what we have done from our point of view is that um, I've been working for um, since the 1980s on a technology that uses electricity to regenerate marine ecosystems. This sounds very bizarre to people. You know, everyone's afraid of electricity, you know, Frankenstein and getting electric shocks and you know, being killed and all that. So uh, no one likes to talk about electricity and water. Um, and of course, naturally, high levels of electricity 
and in particular alternating current, what, what we get out of the wall, you know, it's this alternating 60 cycles a second. Uh, of course, you know, you stick your finger in the electric socket, you're, you're going to you probably kill yourself, especially if you're wet and covered with salt water. So um, that, that can be deadly stuff. But we're, we're talking here about extremely low levels in terms of voltage and current that are completely safe. And we're talking about direct current, which you get from a battery. Now, the fact is, is, you know, we go into the water with a battery on our watch, we go into the water with underwater flashlights, and we're not afraid of it killing us. Okay, I mean, we, we know that's, that's, that's safe because the amounts are very small and the human body can tolerate that. So what we're dealing with essentially are, are voltages and currents that are down in that level, like what you would get from a battery or from a solar panel. And what, what we found, I have to really explain a bit of history here. Um, I had a very close colleague, he died more than 10 years ago, but his name was Wolf Hilberts. And he was an architect who was originally from Germany, and he became a professor of architecture in the United States. And he was interested in trying to produce building materials from the sea. So what his point of view was is that a coral or a snail can grow a shell or a skeleton, very precise architecture and shape, out of dissolved minerals in seawater. I mean, that's, that's, that's not collecting solid stuff, it's taking dissolved material and precipitating it in a precise form and shape. And that doesn't happen naturally. You can watch the ocean for a million years and isn't, the limestone isn't going to precipitate. But what, what he found was, is that if he applied a small current to the water, you could grow limestone rock out of the ocean. And um, I think maybe it's easier if I show some pictures to explain that process and then I'll discuss the applications for seagrass. So let me, um, I'll try to share the screen here and I'm going to show you, uh, can you see this picture here? Yep. Okay, so that is Wolf Hilbert, and he's making a drawing uh, on the bottom. And um, so what he found was that, uh, that's, a, that's a bust of Wolf, sorry, that we have in Bali. But this is what we do. We build structures out of ordinary construction steel. Of any, we can make them in any size or shape. Now, steel is the cheapest, most common building material in the world, as everyone knows. And so we have a lot of experience in bending it and stretching it and welding it and we can build any size or shape with steel, very easy. Now, steel has a fatal flaw when you put it in seawater. It rusts very quickly. So when you put steel in water, it turns red with iron oxide, and eventually it's going to crumble and fall apart. Uh, that's inevitable. So it, it's a very bad construction material to use in the ocean. And in the ocean, people make stuff that looks like this figure out of you know, with concrete steel bars inside of concrete. And what happens is the seawater penetrates those the concrete, the iron rusts. When it rusts, it expands, it cracks the concrete. When it's cracked, the water has even more access, so it accelerates the rusting, and eventually the whole thing falls apart. And every reinforced concrete structure in the ocean isn't collapsing in that sense. I mean, it's inevitable that you see them rust, you see them crumble, they have to be torn down and rebuilt over and over again. So it's a poor material for that purpose. So what we do is something very different. We apply this very small trickle charge to the iron at the right polarity. And then that completely prevents rusting. The electrical current itself prevents rusting. So in this case here, and, and then what happens is something even more amazing. Not only do we prevent rust, we put a little more current into it then we actually grow limestone rock. This is the rock that corals and snails and clams make their shells from. It's a natural material, it's all over the earth. It was formed, every, almost all of this was formed by living organisms. And that's because living organisms <coughs> use their biochemical energy to pull in calcium and carbonate. And they use enzymes and concentrate them and precipitate them in a precise form inside of the cell so that have evolved over billions of years to, to do that. Now, but it doesn't happen naturally. But we find that when we apply the current, we grow that rock right out of seawater. We precipitate it right out of the water. It wouldn't happen naturally. And so the piece that you see here is a, a piece of reinforcing bar, steel bar about the size of my finger. And um, that is about, um, a, you know, about two years of growth of material, of limestone. Now, this is Limestone, of course, is something we've used as building materials from the days of the pyramids. It 
you know, limestone doesn't dissolve, you know, it, well, it dissolves very slowly, so it does dissolve in acid rain. Okay, and uh, you know, as you know, a lot of the old Roman monuments, for instance, are dissolving because of acid rain. So um, that, that can be a problem, but um, that doesn't happen in the ocean. But we can, as a result, grow limestone over steel in any size or shape. The material we grow depends on how fast we grow it. If we grow it very, try, grow it very slowly, less than about one to two centimeters a year, as in this picture that you see in front of you, we can produce material that's two to three times harder than ordinary concrete. Okay, so it's, it's a, a superior material in that sense, in terms of strength, of load-bearing strength. That's, you know, the amount of weight you put on it before it cracks and crumples. Um, we can grow it also very fast, but then we get soft material. So our goal is to do it slowly, very slowly. Now, when Wolf Hilberts invented this process, this, this method, uh, he called it originally mineral accretion. Um, that sounds like the stuff you get in your kettle, you know, <laughs> uh, or in a boiler. But um, and uh, he called it also secrete or cement. But um, I began working with him soon after. I heard about his work quite by chance. That he, there was this guy building things in the ocean, and uh, maybe you could grow corals on it. And uh, he invented this process in 1976. In 1987, I heard about him, and I asked him to come to Jamaica, which is my home island where I come from. So I asked him to come to Jamaica and work with me to try to grow corals. So what we did is he came down to Jamaica, we built our first structures, and I the reefs that I worked in in Jamaica, I've known them since I was a very small child. I've been diving all my life in them. They used to be so beautiful and so full of life, and now they're, they're dead. And you know, we, we killed them ourselves, we human beings. And if this, we, we killed our reefs in Jamaica before global warming. That's, global warming is the number one killer of corals right now. But we killed them because we didn't treat our sewage properly. And what happened is that weedy algae, overgrew and killed the reefs because reefs are not only the most sensitive ecosystem of all to temperature, they're also the most sensitive to nutrients and sediments to every single thing we imagine. So whenever we develop the coastline and we dump our sewage in the water, we cut down the forest and the soil washes into the sea and global warming and, and putting pathogens into the water that cause disease, all of that, we're wiping out our reefs. And so in Jamaica, at the site that I worked in, we were down to the last few corals. Everything was just a mass of weedy algae smothering and killing everything, and you know, one or two little corals here or there. And so I, I transplanted some of these corals onto some of these structures, and astonishing, in three months they tripled in size, and they were growing at record rates in a place where the water quality was so bad that they were dying. And we got corals settling on these structures at very high rates, with an area where there was no natural coral settlement. So we realized we had something biologically that was very interesting. But let me, let me come back, I mean, a little bit here to the, the physical principles. Um, these show more of this material. I call it bio rock. I invented that term because mineral accretion didn't really have an intuitive meaning to people. It just sounds like, like crud, <laughs> you know? Um, so uh, bio rock gives the idea of a, a stone that grows, that's living. And that's what we do, is we're growing rock out of the sea. And these are a bunch of pieces that you see here in this picture that are almost all from the Maldives. And they took, they've grown over about a one, about a two year period in the Maldives with solar panels and other methods. So we apply a little trickle current to them, which we can provide from any source. And that, that I just mentioned that we, we, we use in our project solar panels, windmills, we use tidal energy generators, we use wave energy generators. But in most cases where there's an infrastructure to provide electricity at the shore, usually the simplest way is to convert ordinary alternating current electricity from low voltage direct current, like what you'd get from a battery. Otherwise, you'd have to keep recharging the battery constantly, you know, as it draws down. So we often use electricity for that, but we can use any form of electricity. And obviously, since global warming is the number one killer of corals, we, we try to use clean, sustainable energy, renewable energy, whatever that is possible. But it isn't possible everywhere, unfortunately. So uh, coming back to the materials, I say this is rock. It's growing stone. It's rock hard. The piece you see in the upper left here, and I don't know if you see my arrow here on the screen, yeah. that, that is 
one of the first pieces that Wolf Hilberts grew in Louisiana, near the mouth of the Mississippi River, but in the Gulf of Mexico, where it's about half seawater and half fresh water. Our process is based on the conductivity of the water. We're applying a small voltage, so the electricity flows through the water, and how much flows depends on how conductive it is, and how conductive it is is a function of how salty it is. The saltier it is, the more conductive it is. The Mediterranean is saltier than the Atlantic Ocean, so you would get more current for the same voltage in the Mediterranean than you would in a place like Louisiana, which is half fresh water. So it doesn't work in fresh water. This is not conductive, but it works in intermediate stuff. Well, this piece here in the upper left was one of the first structures Wolf built. And when he came back three months later, this piece he cut out was completely covered with oysters that had grown to adult size in three months. It was astonishing. So we realized there was something there. And we began then to, to uh, you know, when Wolf started working with me in Jamaica, we began applying it to growing organisms. So what we found was, is we could grow essentially all marine organisms Again, at record rates, we found, and I'll, I'll show you some pictures of that a little later. But let me first stick to the properties of the material. Um, this is a piece that grew in the Maldives. We, you know, literally we've cut it out, but you see the steel bars inside. There's no rust on them. They're completely protected. We built this mass of, of uh, rock around them. Um, besides being the only marine construction material that's growing and getting stronger with age, uh, like a real coral reef, um, it also is the only marine construction material that repairs itself. Uh, here is a, some a series of photographs of a structure that we built in Bali, and it was hit by a boat. A boat smashed into it, it cracked off the limestone on the outside and exposed the steel frames. And those steel frames have been in the ocean for 11 years. And I'll, I'll give you a close up. It had no rust. This is a time series. But I'll, I'll give you some close ups here. This is a, after a year. Um, oops, I don't have the initial one. Uh, okay, well, at the beginning, yeah, should be in here, this series, I don't, ah, oh, yes, okay, this is right after the boat hit it, and you can see the steel bar was bent by the impact, but there's no rust on it. It's been in the ocean for 11 years. A year later, that, that, uh, oops, that grew back. I mean, that, this is the area of bare steel that you see here, new limestone grew on it. So these structures actually are able to repair themselves when they're damaged. So they're really unique. They're, they're completely different than any other marine construction material. But you have to think long term because you're growing it slowly. It's not like a concrete wood building that you can pour this thickness of concrete, you know, just pour it and just wait for it to set. And you have a building, you know, a few days later when it's dry. In our case, we have to grow it slowly at this rate per year. And so to build something this big might take you 10 years or 20 years. And obviously people don't have the patience for that. So the, the Wolf's idea as a construction material was valid, but it didn't, you know, it's too slow. People weren't interested. But the fact is that in almost any place that's on the coast, we can produce superior building material. We believe for less cost than a concrete material would cost um, if you have to import the cement Portland cement from someplace else. So in fact, it is a good building material who's not been exploited. And in a place like Mallorca, for instance, um, you know, if you don't make your own cement and you have to import it to the mainland, our material would probably be cheap. So it has unique properties. But the fundamental thing that amazes us is, is the, all these corals and things that grow all over. Some of these are little pieces we put on. But in most cases, they're ones that spontaneously settle. See, that, that's, that's you right after it broke. That's the bare steel, and then a year later. You know? So it's, it has pretty amazing properties. Um, I want to, hold on, let me move through this um, a little bit. Um, Yes, okay, I'm going to go back to the slide sort. I'm going to jump here. What we found was, very briefly, um, sorry, view, slide sort. What we found very briefly was that all forms of marine life are attracted to the electrical field. And this is something because the fundamental basis of all life is electricity. People don't realize that. Every cell of every living organism, from the lowest bacteria up, make their biochemical energy from about a one-tenth of a volt potential difference between the outside of the cell and the inside. And that means that the electrical current flows through the membrane of the cell and life has evolved enzymes that are able to trap that electrical current and turn it into biochemical energy. And every form of life uses the same mechanism. 
goes back to what we call the last common universal ancestor billions of years ago, the, the identical mechanism. So electricity is the basis of life. And we, what we've basically discovered is a way to increase the electrical field within the range that stimulates organisms. Okay, so if you add, you know, if you have no current, you add the current, in fact, they grow faster. Of course, at some point, it, it's too bad and you start to get negative effects. So the very low range of their natural electrical fields, in fact, what, what we've found is, is really that <laughs> there are natural electrical fields due to the magnetic field of the earth and the fact that the ocean is an electrical conductor. And when an electrical conductor moves with the waves through a magnetic field, it sets up a current. And organisms have evolved to utilize that current and we, we're stimulating that. Now, normally what an organism has to do is to spend half, in some cases, more of that biochemical energy maintaining the voltage gradient. If the voltage gradient collapses, the organism dies. It doesn't matter if it's seagrass or a human being or a bacteria, it's the same situation. If that voltage is not maintained, you, you run out of energy. So the organism has to spend a large part of that energy pumping electrons and protons and maintaining that gradient. That's energy that's lost. It's not available for growth or reproduction or resisting environmental stress. In effect, we're giving them that energy for free. And so what we see is that with all forms of marine life, we get higher settlement and they actually attract to the electrical field because they're looking for, for sites that have high wave energy to live off that little, little electrical field. So we, we get, they come and settle spontaneously on our structure. We don't have to put them on. The second thing is that they grow faster. It depends on how much current they're getting, because I mentioned more current, more growth, and then at some point you're, you're too high. So there's a, a broad range in which they increase the growth rate. Um, and we see that with everything that we've looked, measured. We've measured with corals, with oysters, um, many different species. Uh, not all of them, because we don't have the time or the money to do that, but everything we've looked at grows faster. In addition, we get much higher survival and we get much higher resistance to severe environmental stresses. I mean, for example, with corals, I mentioned that global warming is the number one killer. High temperatures cause coral bleaching and coral death. And our corals that are on bio rock reefs survive bleaching when everything around them dies. It's simply that they, they have more metabolic energy, so they, they have more energy for growth, for resisting stress, possibly for reproduction, but we don't know. So it may be, the point is, is that because of these advantages, we're able to keep whole ecosystems alive when they would die because severe temperatures, events, severe stresses, you know, that, that, as we know, are getting worse and worse with global climate change. So we're able to keep whole ecosystems alive when they would die. I'll show you some examples related to seagrass in a minute. But for instance, with corals, we have, we're the only people who keep corals alive in bleaching events with our technology. Um, so um, in addition, because we're increasing the growth rate and the settlement rate of organisms so much, we're able to regenerate whole marine ecosystems and biodiversity at record rates, even in places where there's no natural recovery. So places where all the reefs and seagrasses died, we can grow them back. And um, so it, it, they're really remarkable properties. And it, it, they, as far as we can see, they apply to all marine ecosystems. So in warm waters, we grow coral reefs. In cold waters, we grow oyster reefs. We can grow seagrasses any place in salt marshes and mangroves. And that, that's what we want to focus on here because obviously um, there are corals around Mallorca. I mean, there are two species of corals that, that occur in the Mediterranean that are, um, but they don't build reefs because they're mostly little small ones isolated, but we can grow those too. But in Mallorca, of course, the key interest is seagrass beds. And uh, there were spectacular seagrass beds all around Mallorca. And as in many places, they're, they're dying back. Now, seagrasses we've destroyed about half the seagrasses in the world. They've been dug up. They've been, but part of it is physical damage, you know, port development and dredging and all that. But the main thing actually is, is deteriorating water quality. Seagrasses, they need shallow water with nutrients and light. Now, if the nutrients get too high, the same thing happens to them as happens with coral reefs. Weedy algae take over, overgrow them, and kill them. If the water gets too muddy, they get smothered, they don't have light, they can't grow. 
So what we're seeing in coastal development areas all around the world is the water quality is deteriorating and the seagrasses are dying even where we're not deliberately destroying them. But in many places we've deliberately destroyed them. For instance, I mean, uh, one example is in front of hotels in the tropics. Um, you have a beautiful beach, you have seagrass beds in front. Well, the seagrass beds are the source of the sand. They reduce the wave energy, they protect the shore. But the first thing people do is they dig them all up because they say, oh, our guests don't want to stand in seagrass. They want to stand on sand. So they dig it all up and then they're surprised that the beach disappears. <laughs> you know? So anyway. Um, so just very, just very briefly, Tom, the, the, the seagrass matter that is between um, Formentera and Ivica is actually one of the largest living beings on Earth. It's, it's um, Posidonia Oceanica, and it's um, in terms of extent, because it's, it's one individual, they just clone themselves as they grow. Um, yes. It is, it, and, and all the beautiful, the, the beauty of the Balearic Islands, the attraction to the tourism industry, why people come here is because we have these special turquoise waters, which are based on the white sands, which again, um, go back to Pasadena. Yes. Do, do you know how large those seagrass beds are uh, around? Not off the top the of my head, but I can send you some links. Yes, uh, that we have to look up. Anyway, seagrasses are beautiful ecosystems. Um, the thing is that almost all species of seagrasses require sediment because what they do is that the, it, it's a flowering plant and it's not actually a true grass, but it behaves like a grass and it has underground runners. So in other words, the, the leaves are sticking vertically up, but the roots are growing through the sediment and pretty much all sea grasses require about five or 10 centimeters or so of sediments for the roots to proliferate. So without that sand or mud or something else there, they're unable to spread. And in your case, you know, you have large flat areas covered with sand and that, that allows what you, you say a clone, it allows one single lucky colony to spread over huge areas simply by the roots growing through the sand. Okay, where the sand's washed away, obviously they can't grow. And that's a major problem with seagrasses too, is that extreme physical events like hurricanes or like, like Storm Gloria, what that does is that really digs up the whole mat of seagrass with the roots and throws them away and washes away the sand and you get what we call blowouts, areas where, where there was seagrass but suddenly there's a cliff and the whole thing is washed away. And that must have happened in, in around Mallorca in, in Gloria. We don't seem to have any information yet mapping what damage occurred, but definitely under those conditions you do lose a lot of seagrass. But in the long run, it's deteriorating water quality around ports. And I imagine that you see the decrease in port areas first, although there's a counterbalance, and that is that seagrasses need nutrients. And if the nutrients are low and there's sewage coming in, the seagrass will grow faster until the weeds take over. <laughs> so uh, you, you do, in fact, see faster growth of seagrass around villages and on small remote islands and, and in clean areas because they're living off the nutrients. Anyway, so seagrasses are, are a very important ecosystem and we're wiping them out. Now, there's another point about seagrasses. I mean, seagrasses stabilize the sediment because of the roots. They create a very rich ecosystem that's essentially a nursery ground for baby fish, baby lobsters and other marine organisms. The little things that are hiding between the blades so that they don't get eaten by the bigger fish. And so they're, they're an essential nursery ground. For, for many marine ecosystems that then when they get bigger, they move into other habitats. So they're, they're very important. Um, so all right, there, there's many reasons to regenerate. There's another reason too, and that is that seagrasses, along with salt marshes and mangroves, um, create a marine soil. And they grow the carbon that they produce and the roots, when that deteriorates, it builds up organic carbon in the sediment. And that is, a major sink of carbon globally. As a matter of fact, um, as I mentioned, there's about perhaps 10 times more carbon in the soil than there is in the atmosphere or in the biomass. Uh, people, the numbers are a little uncertain. Some people use lower numbers, but I, I, I think the higher numbers are more accurate. But anyway, five to 10 times more, you, you can argue about that. But half of all that carbon soil is in wetlands marshes and swamps and all that, and half of that is in marine wetlands. Seagrasses, salt marshes, mangroves, that occupy less than 1% of the Earth's surface, but they're holding a quarter of the soil carbon. 
So if we regenerate these ecosystems, they are the, going to be the most cost-effective carbon sinks that we can imagine because you're going to be able to bury the most carbon, the smallest area could the least cost. So that's another reason to regenerate seagrass. Well, yeah. Can I, could I ask you to, because last time we talked, you, you pointed out that in the initial growth, when the blade grows, it actually releases CO2 in the process that, that, that the um, carbon that is precipitated out around the blade, the, the white flaky bits, mm. don't actually create a net carbon sink, that it is only the, the biological material in the marine soils that yeah. is the carbon. It's, a, it's the organic carbon that's buried in the soil that is not decomposed. So basically when, it, when the seagrass grows, it's pulling CO2 in, it's making organic matter. If that organic matter gets eaten or rots or decomposed, turns back to CO2 in the atmosphere. So it's only when they have to get buried where it can't decompose. And seagrasses and salt marshes and mangroves they build up organic carbon. In some cases, they're the highest, most concentrated organic carbon of any soils in the world. They really can build it up and it's, that helps preserve it. So that's the roots and all that sort of thing. But now that the limestone itself is a little different. What people don't understand is that when, when you make limestone in the sea, you're using what's called bicarbonate. That's a dissolved form. And for every atom of bicarbonate that you make into calcium carbonate and precipitate out, in order to maintain the charge balance, that's a physical law you can't violate, the balance of charge, um, like conservation of energy, um, and to maintain the pH, because the ocean is a buffered system, what happens for each molecule of carbon that you take out of the ocean, put into limestone, you release one molecule of CO2. So in fact, limestone deposition is a, one of the geological sources of CO2. Almost everyone gets that backward. They think the more reefs you have, the more CO2 you're removing. In fact, it's adding. But to put that into perspective, I mean, all the reefs in the world are releasing something like less than 1% of what we're putting in from fossil fuel emissions. So the natural sources, long-term source of CO2 are limestone deposition and outgassing of CO2 from volcanoes. Now, the sink is where that CO2 then dissolves in rainwater, falls on the land, dissolves limestone, then that CO2 gets converted into bicarbonate and goes into the ocean. So actually that's, that's the sink, is Limestone dissolution is, is actually a carbon sink. Limestone deposition is a source, but it's small on a global scale. The real sink is bearing carbon. Now, the problem is that the ocean is a very efficient ecosystem. When carbon's produced, it's essentially all eaten and composed. It doesn't build up because it's extremely efficient. I mean, the, the, the phytoplankton, which are the most productive, they live a day or two before they get, go back into CO2. So it's, the ocean's very inefficient at storing, except in marine wetlands. Marine wetlands, seagrasses, salt marshes, etc., mangroves are storing about half of, burying about half of all the carbon in the ocean, even though they occupy much less than 1% of the area. Because in the deep ocean, none of that carbon survives. It all decomposes and goes back to CO2, unless you turn the ocean to a dead zone. That's the only way to make the ocean as a whole a carbon sink. The wetlands we can restore and store carbon very easily. We're going to have to do that on a large scale. And the technology we've developed, because the biorock method also greatly increases the growth of seagrass, salt marsh, and mangroves, then we can accelerate that. And I, I want to show you really a little briefly what we've done. I mean, this is what we've been talking about general background, and uh, we've actually used a fair bit of time. So let, let's move on to, to what we do with seagrasses. Um, and salt marshes. Now, so let me just distinguish. I don't know if your people are familiar with the difference between salt marshes and seagrasses. Seagrasses grow below the low tide mark. They're always in the water. They grow in sediment. The salt marshes are similar types of, you know, grassy organisms. They're grasses, I, I think, in a real sense, but they grow in intertidal areas. So they're exposed to air some of the times, and they're underwater part of the time, so they have to have that exposure and, and, and um, you know, being underwater, that, that they're central to their life. Mangroves only grow in the intertidal. Salt marsh grasses only grow in the intertidal. So they form huge swamps 
that are also huge carbon sinks, and they're very similar to seagrasses. Just, just to briefly let you know, there, there is a, a salt marsh on um, Mallorca, but it's dying, Sauvofera, in the north of the island, because mm -hmm. it happens to be in the area where there's also very intensive potato farming, and, and basically it, um, it's dying because there's so, so many nitrates coming in from... from uh, yes, from well, we'd like to look at that. So, anyway, we we'll, we'll, I'll work here. I'm, I'm going to show you a little bit of what we've done with salt marshes and seagrasses. Um, so let me begin with seagrasses, and I want to show you. Uh, hold on one second. There's a seagrass section in this presentation. Uh, whoops, I had it here. Yes, here. So <clears throat> this is Posidonia oceanica, the same species that you have in Mallorca. And this is in, in um, New Puglia in southern Italy. This is an experiment that we did. Uh, I was working with Raffaele Baccarella, who was the, was the scientist for the Provincia di Bari in Puglia, in southern Italy. And what we did in this case here is that the Posidonia is disappearing there, just like it is in most of the Mediterranean for a variety of causes. And so what we did here is we did the first Bayerock Posidonia experiment, or seagrass experiment, a deliberate one. And here what we did is you see a diver in this picture, and there are two patches here of, of Posidonia growing. Well, literally what we've done is these are patches that are, you know, maybe <laughs> half a meter, a quarter square meter in size. I forget the exact shape. And we took, uh, you can see there's a mesh down here on the bottom. So this is a square mesh about, you know, centimeter size spacing or so. And we put on the bottom, we applied an electrical charge, and you see where the arrow is here at the bottom, they're white. And that's white because the limestone is precipitating out on the mesh. This mesh is flat on the bottom. And what we did in these two places is we put a few Spartina roots and, and shoots into them. Now, it's easy to transplant. You can dig them up and transplant. Now, in fact, let me they say something about that. I mean, people have been actively transplanting seagrass and salt marsh and mangrove. They're easy to plant. You know, you dig them out one place and you stick them in someplace else. And um, people have been doing that on a large scale because all these ecosystems are disappearing. The problem with that is that almost all these restoration efforts have failed. And the reason they fail is because heavy waves wash them away before the roots can grow and be solidly attached. So, I mean, people make very big claims. Oh, we planted a million seagrass plants, but you go back a year or two later, you're lucky to find any surviving. And, so, and the, the, other, the other aspect there is that if you don't do what you're doing is to find a way to increase the growth rate, yes. then taking away from a healthy seagrass meadow somewhere else, the things you plant somewhere else, you've actually done damage over there. And That's correct. The balance isn't actually that positive. That's correct. You have to do better than the original site. So in this particular case, as you see here, here's a diver. Now what we did is this, these structures are part, these little meshes are just very small. I say we can do it any size or shape, and obviously we'd like to do whole you know, tens of square kilometers, but we were beginning on a little pilot scale. And um, this, this project was powered by a solar panel on land about, a, you know, 100 meters away, and a little trickle charge went into these structures. And we only did this experiment for three months, but what's important are two things. First of all, the controls, we had other pieces of mesh that weren't getting electricity, we planted seagrass under them, they all died. They all died. So that's exactly the ecological damage you're saying. You're, you're killing, you're killing it now. Well, unfortunately, we have to do that for scientific purposes, or we like to do that as little as possible. We have to have a control, otherwise no one will leave us. So but the controls all died. Um, these ones here grew like tremendously, and I'll show you a few more pictures. But the point that's important here is the bottom is not sand. This is rock. We grew them on bare rock, something no one else has ever been able to do before, okay, because we had such prolific root growth. And you'll see in the next picture, a close-up there, and there's some of the Posidonia, and here, here's our mesh. And I think, I think that was one centimeter spacing. I'd have to check, but I think that's it. And um, if you look a little more closely here, well, we created whole little mini ecosystems. You see the fish swimming around. This is a close-up of the roots after they, they afterwards. And this is a mussel, mussel settled in it. There were crabs, there were shrimp, there were all kinds of marine worms and stuff. So we created a whole little mini ecosystem, you know, about this big. Um, 
And uh, it did very well. Now, this was a temporary experiment. We only did this for three months, unfortunately. I mean, that, that was what you know, our permits were for. So it wasn't, wasn't to actually do restorations to do an experiment. But uh, it was tremendously productive. Now, I'm, I'm, going to show, I'm, I'm going to show you a video of our seagrass work um, in a minute. Um, but um, what we've seen is that we're mainly not working on seagrass. Most of my work is coral restoration. But many of our coral reefs have sea grasses around or under them. And so we've done many projects in countries around the world where we grow a coral reef and we see the sea grass growing more prolifically around and under them. So that, that um, I'll, I'll show you one video of that in the Bahamas in a minute. That's something we generally see is we see the sea grass being taller and greener around them. Um, now I'm going to jump to salt marshes for a second when I come back to sea grasses. Um, and this, this is a site in New York City. It's a super fun toxic waste site. And we, at that site, um, uh, go, go first. This, is, this is our shoreline. I mean, it's all toxic waste, uh, construction debris and all that. That's the beach. And what we've done is we've planted Spartina alterniflora. Now, this is a salt marsh. It's an intertidal grass. And obviously, we're out there at low tide and not at high tide when it's underwater. And we've... This area was so poisonous, the stuff couldn't grow. So we're growing these with solar panels. You see a solar panel here where I'm moving the cursor. And here's one of our students here, and she's measuring the height. So this is a, a clump of seagrass and toxic waste that we're growing, and she's measuring the height of them. Now, what we saw compared to the controls, you know, control areas where we planted without electricity, uh, we found the seagrass grew much taller. It grew greener. It had grew taller. It also had many more stems per clump. It was just a root mass, and you know, many more stems. But we, we didn't really count that. We just measured the height. Um, and so this is a done. We were the other thing is we're able to grow these lower in the intertidal than they normally could grow. So normally down in the lower intertidal, there is a limit because they don't get enough light, or the wave energy washes them away, and all that. So we're actually all the salt marshes are eroding, natural salt, are eroding because of sea level rise. When you look at a natural salt marsh in most places, you see they're collapsing, the edges are falling into the sea. Um, so they're retreating in land as sea level rise. So it's, it's critical to extend them seaward. So that's what we were trying to do in this experiment in New York City. So here we plant it lower in the intertidal make it grow. And we've been doing that now for about um, 13, 14 years. And we started with just 10 plants, and they're proliferated now. We have hundreds of them growing there. The controls all die every year. What happens is they die back in the winter and they never come back in the spring. But ours just comes stronger and stronger every year. So we're able to grow them tremendously here. And here's an example of the Spartana. Again, this is a mesh that is, I'd say, 15 centimeters in its spacing. And it's very easy to do. We just lay the mesh down and charge it appropriately and we're able to regenerate them. I'll show you, this is some data from Spartana. The reds are just measuring the height, and then this is in the growing season for, for about three months or so. And you can see we measured the height of the controls, and then with a little trickle of electricity and a bit more, we're getting you know, an increase in growth of about double under these conditions. Possibly we could get it much higher if we had a higher, more current. At some point, you start to get negative effects. So we don't really know how high we can go. But what we're able to show is that they're growing taller about twice as fast in this growing season with, with, under these conditions. But also, we have many more stems. And the plants are greener, so they're more, you know, probably more photosynthetic. So we, we showed here that we could regenerate Spartina or salt marsh very effectively with just trickle charge from solar panels and, and seagrass. So, all right. So I, I want to. Um, let me jump now to something else. Um, uh, now, we're planning to apply this to mangroves as well. We believe this is a general mechanism that affects all forms of marine life. And uh, mangroves, for instance, I, I do a, most of my work is in Indonesia. And um, Indonesia is, is, has the world's largest area of seagrass and mangrove in the world, and by far the highest biodiversity of those ecosystems. So it's, it's just the center of of diversity in amounts, and, and they're destroying them. They're destroying them like every place else. They're cutting down the mangroves for shrimp ponds. The shrimp all die from disease. They abandon them, and suddenly, where they used to be a kilometer of mangrove, now there's open water. It's causing massive erosion. 
for instance, in all over Southeast Asia, because half of the areas of mangrove that have been destroyed have been abandoned because they were unusable after a while. So we're trying to regenerate those mangroves and turn them into carbon sinks and orangutan sanctuaries and sustainable fuel uh, sources. It's a long story that we don't need to get into here. So let me, um, let me get back to the seagrasses though. Uh, but as I say, it's a general application to all marine plants, we think. So I'm going to show you, I think, a short video here. And um, this video is just a minute and a half. This shows seagrasses in the Bahamas. Now, in this case here, I didn't lay a mesh down flat. I actually took mesh and I rolled it up into sort of a double cylinder, <laughs> okay? And that way I was trying to create habitat for corals and fish as well as for seagrass. But I just will show you uh, what, what it looks like here. And this is uh, in Abaco in the Bahamas. Yeah, and it was just destroyed by the hurricane, um, devastated. and. Uh, Seagrass beds are crucial habitats as fish nurseries, but there's no place the for sound? fish to hide. There are no structures for them, okay. and so they get eaten by predators. This bio rock reef in a shallow seagrass in the Bahamas has attracted huge populations of fish that hide in here in the daytime and feed at night and vice versa. It's made from a single sheet of fencing material that's been rolled up into a double spiral. It's been charged with six volts and about one amp, about six watts. And there are a few tiny fragments of corals. Corals couldn't grow in this habitat because it's too shallow and hot for them. And so there are very few naturally broken fragments of live coral that are washed in from storms. And we had transplanted a few of them. And as you can see, they've grown quite magnificently. In addition, the seagrass inside this and around the structure is quite green and growing more tall. Seagrass beds worldwide are being wiped out, and they're, it's a huge ecological catastrophe. With Biorock, we believe we can help restore seagrasses and restore fisheries habitat of the species that rely on these habitats. We've done work with seagrasses in the Mediterranean, and we've found that we're able to grow seagrasses on their rock where they normally couldn't grow with prolific root growth and attraction of fish and mussels and clams and a, a whole very complex ecosystem that built up around them. So we believe that BioRock is going to be a crucial method for restoring seagrass habitat and coastal fisheries in the future. I think the point there is that what we see, uh, it's, a little, it's a very short video, of course, but basically if you look at the height of the seagrass, it gets taller in the, around the structure and under them. This is something we've noticed in Panama and other places as well. So we don't have measurements. I mean, I'd say this is easy. We're working in the field. We're just trying to see what we can grow. And, uh, but, but we can see the impact, and it's very clearly that the height is greater under and around these structures. And uh, what we would like to do is to do some work with people in Mallorca who are interested in generating seagrass and see if we can apply our methods uh, to it um, on, on a large scale to regenerate ecosystems. We, we think we have a solution that is, um, you know, it's, it's obviously there's a cost because we have to apply Triple charge of electricity. That's a limitation of our method. But um, we can do that with um, floating solar panels and other methods. And we, we, we potentially could do very large areas with this method. So could we you, think we have something that is new. Could you say a little bit, because you, you've just um, started working in Spain quite extensively and you, you're working on a project in Andalusia um, to protect beaches. Um, could you just tell a little bit more about the background about your work in Spain and, and the partners in yes. it? Yeah, well, that, that's a, a different area. I mean, if you take a look at this picture in front of you here, here is a structure that is a porous, permeable structure. The water goes through it. Okay, if you take a breakwater, solid wall, whether it's in the sea or on the shore, it causes reflection. The way it hits it and bounces off, that concentrates all the force on that plane, and then it washes away all the sand in front, that disappears, and then the sand underneath disappears, washes under it, you get a hole under it, and then the whole structure eventually collapses, it breaks and falls apart. And we saw that in Storm Gloria. Essentially, every seawall in Spain that was hit by that storm caused erosion in front of it. The sand disappeared. And in many cases, the seawall itself was destroyed and broken by the waves. So, so they don't work. I mean, that's, that's one thing that that here in Spain, people have invested so much money in trying to protect their beaches for tourism. And they're building walls and, and, and you know, groins, escogones, you know, all over the place. And the fact is, 
almost all of them fail. People realize that now they're desperate because all these beaches have disappeared. The hotels want that sand back before it warms up and an 80 million tourists show up, you know, looking for two square meters for their deck chair. <laughs> you know, there's no sand there. So they're pretty desperate. But the point is seawalls don't work. They never have worked. Every seawall that's ever been built, if it hasn't fallen down already, it's going to some, at some point in the future. And it's a huge business. Now, the point is what they do is they destroy the ecosystem in front of them and the ecosystem service. So we, what we do is something very different. A coral reef does not work like a seawall does. A coral reef is full of holes like these structures. The water goes through them and it loses energy by friction. The more things grow on it, the, the more seagrass there is, the more clams growing on it, or mussels, the more surface there is and the more they slow the waves down. But because the waves are able to go through, they don't destroy the structure. And that, that's, that's why every place is a coral reef or an oyster reef, you grow a beach behind it. When you kill the coral reef or the oyster reef, the beach starts to wash away. So what we do is essentially is we grow structures, I mean, this is an example here, in front of beaches. And what we've done in eight different places in the world is we have grown back severely eroded beaches at record rates by regenerating the ecosystem in front of them and creating fisheries habitat. I mean, you see on this picture how many fish hang out in this structure. They're looking for a place to hide. In a seagrass bed, there's, there's, there's not very much. I mean, if you're small and can hide behind the, the blades of the grass, that's okay. But for a bigger fish, you know, they can easily be found. But we're creating habitat. We're regenerating the fishes. We're generating all the ecosystem services they provide. It, we're protecting the sand the beach from erosion. And more than that, we're also generating new sand because we're getting prolific growth of organisms that produce sand when they die. Uh, calcareous algae that have you know, the good algae and bad algae. The bad algae are the fleshy ones that overgrow and kill, kill uh, reefs, but the, the good ones are the ones that make limestone. We get prolific growth of them on our structures too. So we're, we're not just protecting the shore, we're actually growing new sand. And, 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 Indonesia, we, we have places where we've had black sand beaches and we're producing so much new limestone sand, there's now a white layer in front of the black sand beach of material we produce. So, so now obviously here in Spain, there's this been tremendous erosion. Um, people realize that the methods they have spent so much money on, they, they failed, they didn't work. And we're at the very beginnings of a of, of situation where extreme events are going to be more frequent and more severe in the future until we control global warming on a global scale. So we have to be prepared for our failures, <laughs> our failures at, at global environmental management. And um, so what we're trying to do in, in places here in Spain would be to grow reefs like this, they wouldn't be coral reefs, it'd be mussel reefs, or oyster reefs, um, whatever grows naturally in that habitat. Uh, we'll try to propagate the seagrass underneath them like we do here. Um, and that, that would be the goal, is in a sense to, this, and the thing about these structures, for instance, is that the sand accumulates under them in storms. But if you had a solid structure, the waves would reflect and they would scour the sand away around them. So. This way we can, in a sense, create sandbars in front of the beaches. And when there's a storm and sand washes away, it'll be sit on the sandbar and can feed back to the beach in the calm season. So we think there's a lot of potential. Now, what, what is interesting is in those places where we've regenerated the beaches, we've done so at a cost that's about 10 times less than what a seawall would have cost. The seawall would have killed the ecosystem services. We regenerate them for a fraction of the price and grow the beach back. Now, um, we have in Indonesia, we've grown back beaches in months at record rates, you know, several meters high, hundreds of meters long, 20 or 30 meters wide. And we've done that at incredible rates. So what we're doing with Blue Regeneration, which is this new Spanish company, that we just formed that um, on Friday last year. We don't even have our website up yet. We'll post that as quickly as we can. We'll, we'll get that to you. But the purpose of Blue Regeneration is to greatly improve our technology to, for power systems. Now, the thing is, we've been mostly doing very small projects, but there's, there's no money in marine ecosystems. There's no funding for marine ecosystem restoration. It's not something anyone, any policymaker has been taking seriously up to now. There's essentially volunteers out there planting seagrass because they know it's the right thing to do, but there's no systematic funding. Now, 
So that's why we've been doing small scale projects like this one I show you in the Bahamas. I built this thing in one day. <laughs> let, me, let me ask you one question, which would also be interesting for the Mallorcan example, is that there's some areas, some of the larger bays around the island where there's a high concentration of hotels um, and basically, unfortunately, Mallorca is still not up to scratch with the way that they treat domestic or general sewage um, and oh, you, get, <laughs> you get eutrophication effects and algae blooms in the summer, which um, of course the tourism industry is not happy about because the tourists don't like mm -hmm. green seas, they like um, blue seas. And mm -hmm. um, in this kind of, like using this kind of technology, if you have a very high nutrient um, density because of runoff, would that yeah. actually improve the growth rate? Would, would that be beneficial and could it help with the eutrophication as well? Well, it depends on the ecosystem. Corals are the most sensitive of all ecosystems to high nutrients because they get overgrown and killed by algae at the lowest nutrient levels. Others are different. We, we, most of the places where people ask us to do projects are severely eutrophic, quite frankly. They're in front of hotels or dive shops and they kill their own ecosystems because they didn't treat their sewage. This is a worldwide problem. It's not just in Mallorca, believe me. Uh, we see this stuff flowing into the water every place with the same concept. Well, our, our projects, the thing about our projects, obviously, is we will get the best results in the cleanest waters. But what is interesting is we also get very positive results in the dirtiest waters where no other method works. I mean, that, that's really pretty important. So, yes, I mean, the algae are a problem. I mean, in the long run, you have to clean up the nutrient sources. But we, we I mean, you see algae on this structure here. This is in water that's, that's two meters deep. Um, there's not much of a tide there. But uh, the algae are not really a problem there. I mean, what we find is that the, we, we build up large fish populations. In fact, that's one thing everyone notices about projects. My goodness, there's a lot of fish here, you know, and you look around and there's hardly any. And, and um, so the fish eat the algae. We wind up building up populations of fish eating algae. And so they, they tend to keep it under control. In fact, we're creating a whole new food chain of um, it's leading towards fish. <laughs> um, just, just briefly, if you're done with the slides, let's, let's stop screen sharing so we can see each other yeah. larger again. Yes, okay, sure. And Let me hit stop share. Yes. yes. And okay. I noticed uh, that Tony Font has joined us. Tony is a, um, he used to work for Greenpeace International and was on the board. He's been a captain on, on the um, World Wildlife, uh, the WWF solar boat, um, and he knows the marine ecosystems around Mallorca and the Mediterranean much better than I. So t Tony, if, if you're there, could, do you want to pop up your video? And, and if you have any questions for Tom, um, I'd love to hear them. Let's see. Tony? Maybe he's away from the screen. <laughs> <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, anyway, let's see yeah. if it comes back. But this has been su super helpful. And I will um, share this with people who are working in marine protection here on the island and, and see whether we can... The, the conversation, again, of marine regeneration is only starting here. But um, it's wonderful that you now have a Spanish-based company and Spanish-based partners. Did you did you mention you also have a foundation um, that is supporting your work? On, on well, the well I'm, I'm, I'm the person and the founder of the Global Coral Reef Alliance. This has been around for about 30 years. This is a non-profit organization based in the United States. Um, we're used to working with no funding because there isn't any in this field, but uh, we work with partners all around the world who, who have a problem and they want help and they, they want to try using our methods. So, um, and that, that we've been doing small projects, but as I say, the magnitude of the problems are so large that doing little demonstration projects isn't really solving problems. We have to be doing this on a large scale. And um, that, that's, that involves complications in terms of powering them. As I say, we have to provide electricity, but when you're providing electricity over square kilometers, you need larger power supplies. They need to be more efficient. We need them to be smart and all that sort of thing. And so the purpose of what we're doing here in Spain is we're working with, with um, engineers primarily, and we're, we're working to try to develop much more efficient power supplies that are smart. They feed data back so we know how they're performing, they're monitoring themselves and so forth. And so uh, that would allow us to do very large projects in Mallorca. Um, a non, you know, non-profit organization um, it's probably not the way to go because at this point, because it's just, just too small an impact. So it allows us to 
make demonstration projects like what I showed you here with, with very little funds. But uh, when we're talking about square kilometers, obviously we need a much more serious organization. And have you, have you got any data on, because I was just thinking, of course, the potential of areas where this could be done would be improved drastically the minute you can grow Posidonia slightly deeper than it would naturally grow. Um, uh, grow. I'm, I'm wondering, with giving it that extra help of mm -hmm. the microcurrent that helps it reproduce faster and, and, and so on, maybe you, you could find that you can actually grow seagrass meadows at a slightly lower depth. That's, that's probably true. I mean, we haven't had the chance to experiment with that. And obviously I'm not going to make claims of something I haven't actually done. You know, it's, it's too easy to do. But, but um, the thing is in general, we find with most organs, we're able to expand their environmental tolerance range to conditions that they would normally be wiped out by extreme events. In the case of deep sea grass, of course, it's turbidity events that block their light or that they get buried in, in mud fast and they can grow. So, it's my view that we can expand their range, but until we demonstrate that we can, we're, we're not going to claim that. Mm -hmm. But it's, I would think that's the case. I mean, you might be able to extend sea grasses into warmer, colder waters and they could tolerate that sort of thing. Um, so yes, there's a lot of possibility. And before, before we wrap up, um, I would like to give you the opportunity, if, if I, any of the people who are working on marine conservation and protection and research in marine um, biology and ecology, here around the Balearics that I, I will try to make this video accessible to and, and actually actively ask them to um, comment on it. Mm -hmm. um, now it would be your opportunity to ask them some questions of what you would like to know about Balearics. Um, so we, I, I can also add those questions to the list so we can move the process forward. Well, I, I, I think <laughs> I've never been to the Balearic Islands, unfortunately, and I, I don't know Spain very well. You see, I'm, I'm a tropical guy and I'm almost always working in coral reefs. So, so this is a bit exotic to me. Um, yeah, but the thing is, um, there are excellent marine scientists here um, who know these ecosystems inside out, and uh, we would like to try to work with them to see if we can apply our method to their situation. Uh, obviously, we, we, want, we want to work with the best people, the ones who know their ecosystem and the organisms inside out, and uh, see if we can help, help mm -hmm. solve the problems here. So we're eager to do that. Mm -hmm. Great. No, because that's that's why I invited this conversation, because there is such an enormous density of top seagrass and, and marine scientists on Mallorca and in the Balearics, that yeah. um, it's just an obvious place. And they, I know yeah. that there are experiments in the Bay of Poyenza that are funded by Endesa and that IMEDEA, the Institute for Advanced Studies of the Mediterranean, which is based in Espolis here on the island, um, have started. But what they're not doing is increasing the reproduction rate or the growth rate. And therefore, it's questionable whether it, there's any real application for it. Because um, well, what I'd say in every place we work, obviously, we're trying to solve a local problem. And we can't, every site is different. You know, it's different mm -hmm. wave energy forces, history, all that sort of thing. So we need to understand the site and the problems very well before we design something that, you know, a project and, and that's why we want to work with local people who know these ecosystems and the changes they've seen inside out. Mm -hmm. I mean typically the people come to us and they say you know it used to be so wonderful here we have almost now almost nothing left can you help and usually they come to us when it's almost all gone you know when the conditions have become so severe and so extreme that you deal with basket cases but at any rate we'd have to come really I'd lo love to come and see these sea grasses now it's too cold for me to go into the water now. I, I, <laughs> I would freeze. I love that, that you don't dive in cold water. I don't like <laughs> diving in cold water. Either. No, but 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 um, I mean, I'd, I'd love to see the ecosystems and learn a lot more about them. And then, I mean, obviously, the, the thing for us to do is to dive in the water with with local people who know those areas and then see what we could do. Um, each site is different. I mean, actually, the, you know, the specific issues obviously relate to the nature of the bottom, the wave forces that you get, the extreme forces that you have to be ready to deal with, not the average condition. Um, and then how you power it. That's a big issue. I mean, you, you have to either be near a place where you can do it from shore, or you might have to use floating solar panels. Uh, it's a very site-specific decision as how to do that most effectively. So that's why we need to know this site. That one of the problems with using DC lower voltages 
over high distances that you have such such loss in the cables. So, yeah. so you can only like efficiently do it when it, when it's close to shore. Um, well, that, that, that's absolutely correct, and and that is precisely the point of the technological developments we're making with new regeneration. Is we're going to be building systems that are more powerful, more efficient, and capable of transmitting over greater distances. I mean, in some cases, what you have to do is transmit other ways, and then drop it down to low voltage to the site because of the transmission losses. I mean, that's why people use high voltage DC you know, mm -hmm. transmission and step them down. Does that already exist off the shelf, like small units that you could sink under? No, water? no, we have, we have built them. And uh, my colleague here, Thomas Sarkozy, is a guy who is designing and building such systems. And the purpose of this company actually is, is to, to make, them, make them available on a large scale. Great. Right now, we've been we've been making them ourselves. These aren't commercially available units. Uh, we, 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 you know, Thomas has basically built them himself, and uh, obviously there's, there's a lot of costs for prototypes and all that sort of thing. But um, we, we, that's that's the hurdle we plan to overcome here. Is the the efficiency issue precisely? Pat, you're on the spot there. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So I'll stop the recording now, and then we can just wrap up, and and then we'll see where this. Um, Provocation um, lands. Okay, so let, let, let me let me just add one more thing. I mean, I'm going to be in Spain probably until late next week. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if there's a possibility to come to my York. I'm very happy to come and meet with people, learn more about your ecosystems and your mm -hmm. problems, which I know only a very small amount at this point because I've never been there. So I'd like to learn from people, but I'd like to show them what we do, show them these pictures. I, we have more too. But, um, and discuss how we could possibly work together. So if there's an opportunity to come to my office, it's not a lot of time lead. And of course, I know everyone is busy and not available, you know, right on short notice, naturally. But um, there might be, if there's a possibility to come to my uh, early next week, say, I'd be happy to come and talk to people and make a presentation. Uh, if not, we'll, we'll try to build for the future. But what I will say is having formed this company here in Madrid, uh, I will be back frequently. Great. No, I, I, I will do my very best to, to see whether we can arrange something for next week. And if yes. not, it's on your next week, uh, visit to Spain. That, that will okay. be great. Well, thank you so much, Dan. It was a pleasure seeing you again. And uh, we hope we can do something in Mallorca. Likewise. Really thank, thank you so much both for, for your work in the world. And I mean, and also, I think that your two books are just the Bibles, as we now finally moving into regeneration, the, the book on, on soil ecosystems regeneration and on marine ecosystems um, regeneration are, are, are going to be classics for the okay. future because... Well, I have to get a copy of your book sometime too, but <laughs> yes. Next time okay. I'll give you one, promise. Okay. 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 I'll, I'll stop the recording here.